church has eyewitness account of the resurrection of the dead. Acts chapter 10, verse 40 and 41. The scripture says, this is now um, the apostle Peter uh, relating to the Gentiles. He's preaching to them for the first time. And he's relating to them the, about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he was raised from the dead. And so uh, there were eight other disciples with Peter at the time that he was preaching to the Gentiles. And so Peter was referring to himself and the other eight. We know the scripture sign doesn't tell us who those other eight were. Um, but what Peter does say to the Gentiles is that we ate, talking about himself and the, and the other eight men that were with him, we ate and drank with our Lord Jesus after he was raised from the dead. And so that's their eyewitness account, that's their testimony given. Now we know that these men's testimony is exceptional in that it is completely uh, full of integrity. Because don't forget that all of the, 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 the apostles of the Lamb, except for one, John, um, were martyred for their faith in Christ. Now, had they been lying about the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, they would never have given their lives for that lie. But they knew because they had seen the Lord, they'd handled Him, they'd eaten and drunk with Him. Because our Lord appeared for a period of 40 days after He was raised from the dead to numerous disciples. And it was obviously these disciples as well. And so because these disciples had seen the risen Lord, they were quite prepared to die, be martyred for our Lord Jesus Christ because uh, the, they knew his resurrection was true. Another account we pick up, the Apostle Paul just giving us um, a brief timeline of the disciples seeing our Lord Jesus Christ after he was raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 8 says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, talking about Peter, then by the twelve, after that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to, present, to the present, sorry, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time, Paul speaking about himself. And so there's a number of uh, disciples here in this list that uh, Paul speaks about with, of those whom our Lord Jesus Christ physically appeared to after he was raised from the dead. He doesn't list them all. He doesn't have uh, an understanding of all that, that our Lord appeared to because our Lord also appeared to um, Mary. In fact, Mary Magdalene was the very first disciple that our Lord Jesus Christ appeared to after he was raised from the dead. Um, but Paul starts off his list by listing Peter. Now we know that our Lord appeared to Peter that afternoon. Our Lord appeared to Mary that morning uh, before he had ascended to the Father because when he appears to Mary, he says to her, do not touch me, don't handle me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. And so Jesus couldn't go into the presence of God having been uh, touched by anyone because he would then not be the spotless Lamb of God before God. And so he, he then, he appeared to Mary, but she didn't touch him. Um, he then ascended into heaven that morning and he took his, his blood to the, in, into the presence of God and offered up his blood as this, this uh, atoning sacrifice for the sin of the world. That sacrifice was accepted by God the Father. Our Lord then came back to the earth that afternoon and appeared to Cephas, Peter, and he spoke to him one on one because we know that night when the two disciples from the Emmaus came back and they said, the Lord appeared to us, they said he's appeared to Peter as well. So he had appeared to Peter that afternoon. The, the, the two on the road to Emmaus, Paul doesn't pick up in his account either. Uh, because we know that that happened again late afternoon into the evening that our Lord walked with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. We picked up that account in the book of Acts. Our Lord then, uh, they didn't recognize our Lord at the time, 
but he broke bread with them. When he broke bread, they, he opened their eyes, they didn't recognize him, and our Lord disappeared. They turned around immediately, they went back to Jerusalem. They joined up with the other disciples, and they said, you know, the Lord's appeared to us. The other disciples said, yes, he's appeared to Peter. Um, and then our Lord appears in their midst at that time. Now, Paul talks about then, the, then by the twelve. At the time that Jesus appeared to them that night, so he appears to Mary in the morning, Peter in the afternoon, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus in the evening, and he appears to the eleven plus a lot of other disciples in that room that night. Now, Thomas wasn't with them at that time. There were only the eleven apostles um, yeah, the 11 apostles were there in the room at that time. Uh, eight days later, the scripture talks about the fact that our Lord then appeared to them again, and Thomas now was with them, and our Lord says to him, Thomas, uh, you see me? Uh, put your finger in my hand, because that's what Thomas got upset about, because uh, when our Lord appeared to all of the disciples that night in the room, to convince them, he said, now touch me, handle me, see, a, a spirit has not flesh and bone such as you see I have. And so whereas that morning uh, Mary couldn't touch him because he hadn't yet ascended to the Father, now he's come back and he had been to heaven and ascended to the Father. Now it was quite possible for everybody to touch him. And so he encourages the disciples, touch me, see that a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones such as I have. Now obviously our Lord said to the disciples, put your finger, he's got a, uh, our Lord's got holes in his hands where the nails went in. He's got holes in his feet where the nails went in. Um, he's got the hole in his side where the spear went in. Because that night, our Lord says to them, put your finger through. Because you can see right through. That hole is right there all the time. It's a reminder to God of what he did for us. And to us as well, I suppose. And so you can actually put your finger through there. And that's what our Lord allowed the disciples to do. And you can actually put your hand into our Lord's side because that hole is still there. Uh, which again is what our Lord allowed the disciples to do. He wanted them to see that this is him in his resurrected body. And you recall he even ate uh, honeycomb and broiled fish in their presence that night while he was talking to them. So Thomas gets to hear about it the next day. I said, the Lord was here and this is what he did. Uh, Thomas gets very upset about it because, you know, he just, his nose is put out of place because Jesus didn't wait for him to be in this room at the same time. And that's why Thomas says, unless I can put my finger into the nail print of his hands, and unless I can put my hand into his side, I won't believe. Thomas is sulking, basically. So eight days later, our Lord appears, and Thomas says, okay, Thomas, come along, put your finger in, put your hand in, and be, and be believing. Um, Thomas says, my Lord, my God. And Jesus said, because you have seen, Thomas, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And so that's pretty much the account. That's now the 12 that Peter, um, Paul talks about. But then Paul talks about the 500, where our Lord appeared to at one, all at one time. Now that is the account where our Lord appeared to the disciples on the mountain in Galilee. Throughout our Lord's ministry, he had said to the disciples, after I've raised from the dead, I'm going to appear to you. And he, he, he obviously pointed out the, the mountain to them. Uh, you guys need to come here on this day. And he made the, the appointed day. Scripture silent us when it was. It was obviously within the 40-day period. Um, and he said, I will appear to you all on that day. So that's exactly what happened. You go read the account. They all went down to that mountain on that particular day, over 500 disciples. And on that mountain, Jesus then appeared to all of them at the same time. And so that's this account that Paul is talking about, when our Lord was seen by over 500 brethren at once. And he said, most of them are still alive. At the time that Paul wrote the letter, he said, most of those 500 are still alive, but some of them have fallen asleep. So some of them had passed on already and gone to be with the Lord. So that's the, the timeline of our Lord appearing to disciples. And so Paul is saying, guys, you can go check it out, because there's a whole bunch of them that are still around. They were there. They saw the risen Lord physically. Um, and you can go go ask them about it. They will tell you all about it. Then he says he was seen by James. Now, James being the Lord's brother. This is not James, uh, one of the apostles of the Lamb. Um, we know that J our Lord appeared to Jude as well, because Jude was also an apostle, and Jude was one of the Lord's brothers. James was the Lord's second uh, brother, oldest brother. Not oldest, but you know Jesus was the oldest. Then came James, 
Then there were two other brothers, and then Jude was the last uh, born to Joseph and Mary. So those are the two brothers that Jesus grew up with, uh, whom he appeared to after he was raised from the dead, and then they believed in him. Prior to that, they didn't. all of the brothers didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah. But after Jesus appeared to those two, then um, they believed in our Lord Jesus. Then Paul goes on to say, and then Jesus appeared to all the apostles. Now, all of the apostles would have been Barnabas was an apostle. Um, Junior, um, there's a whole lot of apostles. There's a list of 23 actually in the book of Acts um, that are listed as apostles in the, in the scripture. So there's far more than just the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And our Lord appeared to each one of them. And then Paul said, last of all, he appeared to me as one born out of due time. And so those are the eyewitness accounts that we have of our Lord physically appearing to uh, his disciples. Now, since that time, Jesus has appeared to a number of his disciples, even after uh, the Bible was closed off um, and the book of Acts. We have accounts, even up to uh, more recent accounts, we have our Lord appearing to Smith Wigglesworth who was uh, an apostle that was ministering on the earth roughly at the turn of the, the 20th century, I think of the 20th, late 1800s into the 19, early 1900s. He appeared to Smith Wigglesworth, he appeared to Kenneth uh, Hagen as well. So our Lord has appeared, and he's, both those saints have since gone to be with the Lord. Our Lord has appeared to many, and so we have numerous eyewitnesses accounts. Um, all men of integrity, eyewitnesses that we can trust and rely on. And so that is the, the, uh, the testimony that we have of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so the resurrection is central to the Christian faith. We need to believe the resurrection more than that Christ died. We do need to believe that Christ died. But without the resurrection, the death is not, it doesn't solve the problem. We need the resurrection in order to be born again. For if Christ wasn't born again, neither can we. If Christ wasn't raised from the dead, neither will we be able to. And so we have to, as Christians, believe in the resurrection. And so in order for us to be saved, the criteria is not to believe that Christ died. The criteria is to believe that Christ was raised. We pick it up in Romans chapter 10, verse 19. Scripture says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has what raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so the criteria to believe and thus be saved is we must believe that God has raised Jesus from the dead. That is um, the central um, core kind of to the, the Christian faith. We have to believe that Christ was raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 14 to 18 says, at, because there were people that were, that were uh, questioning the resurrection, in, even in the church, because there had been some weird doctrine that had gotten into the church, and Paul had to address it. And so he's addressing it in the church at Corinth. He says, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. He said, what's the point of us preaching if Christ is risen? And your faith is also empty. So you, what do you believe in? If, if Christ is not raised from the dead, what's the point of being a Christian? Verse 15, yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified that God has raised up Christ. And so Paul is talking about the fact, you know, we saw the Lord. He appeared to us and we're telling you that Christ has been raised. And so if he hasn't been raised, well, then we're actually liars and you believe in a lie. And so you're in a bad place, basically. Um, and we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And so we see that without the resurrection, the Christian faith becomes null and void. And so it is central to the Christian faith that Christ has been raised from the dead, and he has been, in fact been raised from the dead. Why is it central? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 and 12 says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and of calves, but with his own blood. He entered into the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And so Christ had to take his blood into the holiest of all and present it to God the Father 
in order to obtain eternal redemption. Had he not been able to do that, there's no redemption. And so the world remains in their sins. Even though Christ died for the sin of the world, had he not been able to uh, take his blood into the holiest of all and present it to the Father as the atoning sacrifice, well, all of that would have been um, a good and a noble thing to do, but it wouldn't have saved the world because his blood had to be, he had to take his own blood into the holiest of all and present it to the Father. And it was only that act that obtained eternal redemption for the world. And so the resurrection of Christ is in fact central to the Christian faith. Christ is the first fruits to be, he is the first one born from the dead and he is the first one raised from the dead. And we need to uh, be very, very clear about this in our minds and that's, the, as I say, that's central to our, our Christian faith. And so what about the, 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 the body of our resurrected Lord? What is it like? Because that is the body that is promised to each one of his saints. That when our Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth at his second coming, it is at that time that the believers will receive their resurrected bodies. So we want to have a look at what our Lord's body is like so we can have an idea of what our resurrected bodies will be like when we get them. And the account we can pick up is in Luke 24, 36 to 43. I've already alluded to the account, but let's just read it. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit or a ghost. Uh, that's a more accurate translation. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, Have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. And so, very clearly, a resurrected body is tangible, can be felt. The Lord said, handle me, feel me. You know, the Spirit doesn't have a body like this, of flesh and bone, no blood in it. Why? The blood is uh, in heaven, it's been presented by God, to, uh, to God the Father as the atoning sacrifice. And so our resurrected bodies will be made of spirit and flesh and bone, but not of blood. There will be no blood in our veins either, because we're one body with Christ. And so that's part of what our resurrected bodies will be like. Our Lord could appear and disappear. He stepped out of um, the spirit realm into the physical realm, and he stepped back into the spirit realm instantly. We will be able to do the same when we get our resurrected bodies and give us an idea as to how we will travel around the earth when we're on the, on the earth reigning with our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we will all be located centrally in the Middle East around the city of Jerusalem. That's where the camp of the saints will be. But we will nevertheless be ruling over the rest of the earth. And so a saint who has been given authority to rule over Peru on this, in South America for argument's sake. Uh, we need to get there in order to see that everything's going right and then come back to where they are. So how would they do that? They would step out of the physical into the spirit, instantly be in Peru, step out of the spirit into the physical on the other side. And it sounds like a, a portal, I suppose, if you can think of it in science fiction type of, uh, terminology, but it's instantaneous that they're moving around. And so uh, the resurrected body can move between the two realms. Currently, these physical bodies can't, unless God allows it, unless God takes the person. Paul, when he was taken up into heaven, he said, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows how he did it. So God is able to do that, take our physical bodies currently and put them into the spirit realm and bring them back again. But the resurrected body that the saints will have at their will, they will be able to move in and out between the two realms all the time. That's one of the things. Um, the resurrected body will partake of food. Jesus ate broiled fish and a honeycomb in their presence. And what happens to that food, it seems to just dematerialize. Um, but nevertheless, it does enter the body. But it's not like a, a digestive system that we have in this physical body. Why do we know that? Because Paul said that God will, in his uh, letter to the Corinthians again, 
that foods for the body and the body for foods, God will destroy both it and them. Speaking about the foods and the, and the stomach, sorry, foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, God will destroy both it and them. And so talking about the stomach will be destroyed. So the resurrected body doesn't have um, internal organs such as we understand it, with this body that we live in. Although on the outwardly it looks the same, it has flesh and bone, it doesn't have the internal organs that these bodies have. So it doesn't have a heart that pumps blood, there's no blood in, the, uh, in that body. So the, the, I don't know what else it has inside there, but Paul did tell us that it won't have a stomach. And so there's no, that food that entered into our Lord's mouth and he ate that day, it seems to that it just dematerializes. Just like that body can move in between realms, so the food just disappears as well. Um, so that's one of the other aspects. The body is recognizable. They recognize the Lord Jesus. They couldn't get their minds around it. They've never seen somebody raised from the dead before. They saw Lazarus raised from the dead, but not Jesus in this way. Okay, Because Lazarus couldn't go walk through our walls after he was raised from the dead. He had a normal body just like he had before he died. Um, and so that, you know, that, that Jesus had to you know, really convince them about this body that he was dwelling in. Um, but nevertheless, they still recognized him. So it wasn't the case of Jesus appeared to them in a form that they didn't have a clue who this person was. They knew who it was. They just couldn't understand how he got where he was. Because they'd seen him being crucified. They'd seen the state of his body. Because don't forget, our Lord, the scripture says, his body was marred more than any man. Our Lord's body was absolutely... Ah, completely de demolished by the Roman soldiers when they scourged him and when they crucified him. But nevertheless, here he stood. And so our resurrected bodies, when we get them, will look just like we do now. We're not going to look different. We'll look exactly the same. We also touched on what Samuel's spirit looked like in the, in the previous teaching. So that's pretty much a, 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 a look at what our Lord's resurrected body is like in that form, but it takes on different forms. Look at this passage of Scripture, Revelation 1, 12 to 17 says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. Having turned, I saw the seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went the sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I'm the first and the last. This is John, seeing our Lord Jesus, in his glorified resurrected body. Now John had been one of the disciples um, who saw our Lord that night and touched him and handled him and watched him eat honeycomb and broil fish. John had seen our Lord a couple of times after that. Uh, they had been fishing, our Lord prepared a breakfast for them, they shared a meal with him. So John had seen the Jesus in the form that he, un he recognized when Jesus was on the earth. But now John is seeing Jesus completely differently uh, in his same resurrected body, but now displaying the glory of God. And John faints when he sees Jesus like that. So, you know, it gives us another idea of what our resurrected bodies will be like. On certain occasions, our bodies will take on certain forms. When we stand in the presence of God, for argument's sake, and worship before his throne, it's quite possible that the glory of God will be made manifest through us, even as our Lord Jesus' body displayed the glory of God. Look at this, another um, aspect of our Lord's resurrected body. Revelation 5, 6-7 says, And I looked, and behold, in, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now that is obviously speaking about Jesus Christ our Lord. John now, seeing our Lord standing before the Father, he sees Jesus take on the form of a lamb. He has seven horns on his head. He has seven eyes on those horns. 
That's not the kind of Jesus that he's been used to seeing while Jesus was walking around on the earth. Jesus made a comment this, uh, about this uh, roughly when he spoke to Nicodemus. He said to Nicodemus, if I've spoken to you about earthly things and you don't believe, how are you going to believe I, I tell you about heavenly things? And here's heavenly things. I mean, how do we understand that our Lord and Savior, who we have been made in the likeness of, can take on the form of a lamb with seven horns uh, sticking out of his head and seven eyes. That's a being we've not ever seen before, but that's still Jesus. And so, and again, uh, uh, Paul speaking about uh, the rock that was struck that gave gushed water out um, when the, the, the Jews were in, in the desert and they were needed water. Moses struck the rock. Paul says that rock was Christ, and that rock followed the, the Israelites wherever they went. And so there's Jesus again, taking on the form of a rock, taking on the form of a lamb, taking on the form of normal person that the disciples could recognize, taking on the form of a glorified being that Paul uh, John faints when he sees. And so our resurrected bodies that we will receive, if they're anything like our Lord's body, and they should be, because we should be, the Bible says, we will receive the same body that He has. As He partook of flesh and blood that we have partaken of, so we will partake of His resurrected body. And so our resurrected bodies will be certainly glorious and uh, able to take on different forms, able to do amazing things. Um, it really is... Uh, the doctrine of um, the resurrection of the dead is an amazing doctrine because it is such an eye-opening um, account of the supernatural that will be freely available to all of the saints when the day occurs that we, in fact, receive our resurrected body. But in today's teaching, we wanted to look at Christ the first fruits. For he does have preeminence in all things. He is the first to be born again from the dead. He is the first one to be raised from the dead. And currently, he has a resurrected body that is glorious indeed. We're going to end the teaching.